Hello everyone, uh, I'm Matt Foster. I want to thank y'all for taking the time to view my presentation. I also want to thank Mr. Justin Dufour for giving me the opportunity to speak. I'm the new corn, cotton, and grain sorghum specialist with the LSU Ag Center. I started two weeks ago. I'm domiciled at the Macon Ridge Research Station in Winsboro, Louisiana. I'm originally from Concordia Parish. I graduated from LSU in 2018 with a PhD in agronomy. And for the past couple of years, I've been uh, working with sugarcane and soybean production in South Louisiana. Uh, with that being said, most of my research focuses have been on sugarcane and soybeans. Uh, so I didn't have any uh, data to present on corn, cotton, or grain sorghum for this presentation. So I reached out to other uh, specialists in, in neighboring states to obtain data for this uh, presentation. Uh, as far as this presentation, I'm going to speak about corn, uh, plant population, and row spacing, and I'm going to touch on uh, grain sorghum production. So first off, I want to talk about factors that can affect corn yield. Uh, these are just a few uh, listed of many. Uh, first off, obviously, is the weather, uh, timely inputs, uh, the hybrid you choose to plant, your planting date, plant population, uh, uniform emergence is very key. Uh, your fertility programs, your irrigation and drainage, uh, weed, insect and disease management, and uh, getting that crop out in a timely fashion. As far as uh, you know, corn plant population, uh, LSU Ag Center recommends 32,000 to 36,000 seeds per acre. There's a lot of discussions uh, about increasing plant populations. You know, some of these high yield contest winners get these high yields from uh, running these very high plant populations. What about normal everyday yields? Uh, it's really going to depend on your particular operation, uh, whether you're irrigated or dry land, you know, what yield potential do you have on your farm? Uh, what about, you know, hybrids can respond differently to differences in populations. I'm going to show a slide a little later about uh, how two different hybrids respond to a, a high population. And you can have some negative effects to increasing population. Just because you increase population doesn't always guarantee increased yield. Uh, you can have reduced economic returns. You spend too much money on seed, uh, lower yield. You get more, you know, uh, interplant uh, competition. Those plants are too crowded, and uh, you also have lodging potential when you increase that population. Here's a graph from Dr. Jason Kelly at the University of Arkansas. Uh, he tested uh, five hybrids. Uh, on 38 inch rows with uh, five uh, plant populations. And as you can see on the graph, these hybrids are responded differently to different uh, plant populations. Some hybrids uh, did better at a higher population and some did better at a lower population. And you know, this kind of depends on the, the ear type of that particular hybrid. Those full flex ear varieties tend to do better uh, at a lower population. And in order to get the most potential out of your uh, fixed ear varieties, uh, they do generally do better at a uh, higher plant population. Here's a picture from Dr. Jason Kelly at the University of Arkansas. Uh, it's the same field, uh, two different hybrids planted at a high plant population. As you can see, the hybrid on the left is still standing upright, and the hybrid on the right is severely lodged. Uh, this just goes to show you how uh, some hybrids can take the stress of a higher plant populations, and some hybrids cannot, uh, as indicated by the uh, hybrid on the right. I want to briefly discuss some work done by my predecessor, Dr. Dan Frommy, at the Dean Lee Research and Extension Center in Alexandria, Louisiana. Uh, from 2015 to 2017, he did some corn plant population studies where he looked at eight seeding rates ranging from 20,000 all the way up to 55,000. Here's a graph from Dr. Frommy's work at Dean Lee. Uh, on the x-axis, you have your final plant populations, and on your y-axis, you have your uh, bushels per acre. Uh, and as you can see, the optimal uh, range is that 30,000 to 35,000. Uh, that's where the majority of your yield was made. And you did get a slight bump going to 40,000, but again, the question is, do you get an economic return when you're spending uh, more, more money on seed? Here's another graph from Dr. Frommy's work at Dean Lee, uh, average of 12 trials from 15 to 16. And it follows that same trend as the previous graph. Uh, you get that optimal uh, yield between your 30,000 and 35,000 uh, uh, plant population. And you do get an increase uh, 
as you increase those populations. But again, the question is, will you see an economic return uh, if you increase that uh, seeding rate? Here's another graph uh, from Dr. Fromme's work at Dean Lee. It sums up uh, 15 trials from 2015 to 2017. On the x-axis, you have your bushels per acre, and on the y-axis, you have your seeding rate. And again, it shows that same trend uh, as the previous uh, graphs. You get your optimal yield at that 35,000 uh, seeding rate, and you do get a slight bump from increasing those seeding rates. But again, as I said earlier, uh, we see an economic return uh, from increasing those seeding rates uh, is the question. Here's a graph from Dr. Jason Kelly at the University of Arkansas. It's a plant population study he did where he looked at five hybrids planted on 38 inch rows at uh, five different plant populations. On the uh, x-axis you have your plant population and on the y-axis you have your yield in bushels per acre. And as you can see, it still follows that same trend uh, as the previous uh, graphs that I showed. Uh, at that 34,000 range is, is their recommended population. And as you can see, the majority of your yield uh, was made uh, in that 34,000 uh, range. And just to sum up your uh, plant populations and your seed cost per acre, uh, here's a slide from Dr. Jason Kelly at the University of Arkansas. Uh, you have your plants per acre on the x-axis and your yield in bushels per acre on the y-axis. And this is assuming uh, $300 a bag, 95% uh, emergence. And as you can see, as you increase your plant populations, of course, your seed cost per acre uh, goes up. But as I said earlier, I just want to reiterate, as you increase those uh, plant populations, uh, you get to a point where you don't see a benefit and it's costing you uh, more money than you're going to see uh, returned in yield. So just to sum up uh, plant populations, that 32 to 36,000 uh, plant population will achieve uh, optimal economic yield for most hybrids. It can get higher yields with higher populations, but will it pay? That's the question. It depends on the hybrid environmental conditions that it's grown in. Uh, increasing plant population does not automatically increase yields. Uh, you know, what else is limiting your yields? Is it water? Is it fertility? You know, by increasing that plant population, is it uh, making your limiting factor in the field worse? So I want to switch gears and talk about uh, row spacing. Uh, so the most common row spacing in Louisiana is 38 inches. And I also ask why that is. Uh, is it just because it's always been done that way or are people like to, you know, in the past have, have always grown cotton or is it, you know, due to irrigation practices or that's just the way your, your uh, granddad did it. Uh, as far as uh, 30 inch row spacings, are, they're the standard uh, in the U.S. Corn Belt. Some advantages of 30 inch row spacing, you get a faster canopy closure, better weed control, uh, more efficient utilization of resources uh, such as light, nutrients, and water uh, due to the improved plant spacing. Uh, you get potential for increased yield. Mississippi has shown an 8 to 9 percent increase. Nationwide, they've shown a 10 percent increase uh, when going uh, to a 30 inch spacing. Here's some uh, row spacing work done by Dr. Eric Larson at Mississippi State University. Uh, it's comparing uh, 30 inch uh, versus 38s versus twin rows. And they showed a yield advantage uh, when they used uh, 30 inches uh, versus uh, the 38s and the twin rows. Now, some of this uh, work has been done in Louisiana, but the data was uh, variable. Uh, I do plan to uh, continue some of this work in Louisiana, uh, looking at uh, narrow row space in, in corn. And as I mentioned earlier uh, about that, uh, you know, increased uh, plant space, and when you go to a narrow row space, and you get that uh, uh, better plant space and geometry. You know, as you can see at uh, 36,000 uh, seed per acre, uh, looking to at a 30 inch space and versus a 38, you got about six inches between the seed at a 30 inch row space and where you got about five inches between the seed at a 38 inch space. And so, you know, you're given, given that uh, that plant, your seed to seed spacing is, uh, is more, so your plants are not as crowded. So what about wide beds? You know, where I've been working the past couple of years, uh, 
they grow sugar cane on some uh, very wide beds uh, compared to uh, all the other crops in the state. So you got some growers that are going to a 60 inch wide bed and what this allows for is uh, to plant two uh, 30 inch rows, whether it be uh, corn or soybeans uh, on each bed or you can drill uh, soybeans which you can have four drills uh, 15 inches apart and also allows producers to still plant cotton on either a two in one out configuration or on a 60 inch center which is currently under evaluation at the northeast research station in st joseph louisiana uh, my future plans are to collaborate with lsu action or scientists and county agents to compare uh, 30 inch rows versus 38s uh, and kind of fine tune some of those production practices and uh, evaluate a 30 inch uh, ag practices on uh, wide beds. Switching gears, I wanna talk about grain sorghum. Um, I know grain sorghum acres is gonna be up this year in the state. Um, you know, in years past, the acres has kind of dropped off, but I think of Oils Parish has, uh, you know, been one of the higher uh, producing parishes in the state as far as grain sorghum. So why would you even wanna consider grain sorghum besides the price? Uh, it's a drought tolerant crop. You have a long planting window. Uh, rotation benefits for uh, crops such as cotton and soybeans. Uh, lower input costs compared to many other crops. Uh, that's if you, you're you not having to spray all the time for uh, sugarcane aphids, but uh, traditionally lower inputs. As far as uh, grain sorghum hybrid selection, some characteristics you want to uh, look for when selecting a hybrid. Uh, you want a hybrid that's adapted to uh, growing conditions in Louisiana. Uh, obviously, a uh, high yield, uh, standability, uh, days of maturity, disease and insect tolerance, uh, pre-harvest sprouting, uh, drought tolerance. And you can find information uh, to so help select your hybrid from the LSU Ag Center, uh, different seed companies. Uh, you want a hybrid that's performed well in multiple locations uh, through, over multiple years. And you want to pick uh, two or three hybrids to grow on your farm. Uh, don't put all your eggs in one basket and just uh, planting uh, one hybrid. So as far as uh, grain sorghum row spacing, uh, grain sorghum really likes a uh, narrow row spacing of 30 inches or less. Uh, grain sorghum planting dates, uh, South Louisiana is going to range from April 1st to May 1st, uh, North Louisiana, April the 15th to May 15th. Uh, you want the five day average soil temp uh, to be at least 60 degrees at the two inch depth. And the uh, seventh day forecast is for uh, warm weather. You know, at least 60 degrees, uh, 65 degrees uh, is uh, optimal temperature, but it needs to be at least 60. One uh, important note uh, with grain sorghum seeding rate is grain sorghum seed can vary uh, in size a lot. So uh, it can vary from 12,000 to 18,000 grain sorghum seed per pound. So seeding rate should be based on seed per acre and not uh, pounds per acre of seed. So some uh, key growth stages of uh, grain sorghum, obviously you have your emergence. Uh, uh, three leaves fully emerged, five leaf, uh, your head initiation, this is about 30 days, uh, then your flag leaf, and then the boot stage, which is around 55 to 65 days, and then flowering all the way up to uh, your physiological maturity. So as far as uh, fertility requirements, uh, grain sorghum requires two pounds of nitrogen for every 100 pounds of grain yield. Uh, that equals around 1.2 pounds of nitrogen per bushel. So for 107 bushel yield, uh, you require 120 pounds of N. So behind a soybean crop, you, you know, your typical nitrogen credit is around 40 pounds. You know, if your soil is high in organic matter, it depends on the yield potential of the soil, ranges from five to 25 pounds of, of nitrogen per percent uh, of organic matter. Uh, to maximize yield and nitrogen efficiency, you can consider uh, when you're applying it, put a starter, 50% uh, pre-plant, 30% side dress, and 20% uh, at uh, the boot stage if possible. Other nutrient requirements, uh, phosphorus, you want to maintain a soil level of 60 to 80 pounds of P2O5. You know, your uh, phosphorus fertilizer rates can be cut in half by banding rather than applying broadcast. Uh, potassium, uh, sorghum requirements similar to nitrogen. 
Uh, sulfur may be beneficial in a high yield environment. Uh, consider applying it in a starter uh, if needed. So switching gears to harvest aids, uh, some of the benefits of using a harvest aid in grain sorghum is you get more efficient and faster threshing, uh, dry out uh, of those uh, late emerging sucker heads. It kills the sorghum plant, which is a perennial plant, and you get some late season weed control. So as far as uh, determining uh, physiological maturity, uh, you need to determine the black layer. Here we have uh, five kernels. Uh, going from uh, most mature to least mature from uh, left to right. The first two have a fully developed black layer with the third kernel is uh, just uh, showing uh, the black layer visible and the kernels to the right are your least mature. So uh, if the majority of your field looks like the, the first three kernels going from left to right, uh, you should be safe to uh, go ahead and apply harvest aid. Uh, your options as far as harvest aid products, you have glyphosate, uh, cofrentrazone, and sodium chlorate. Uh, I want to touch on lodging. You know, it's a good idea to apply harvest aids uh, to only the fields that can be harvested within 14 days of application. Uh, you don't want lodging to be an issue in your field. You know, charcoal rot uh, can, uh, can make lodging worse. I want to wrap up by showing you the link to our uh, grain sorghum website. Uh, you can go to lsuagcenter.com and go to crops and go to grain sorghum. Here you can find information on hybrids, uh, agronomy, disease, and insect and weed uh, management, as well as crop budgets. And uh, we do our annual publication, the grain sorghum hybrids for grain 2021 is available on there. Uh, it, it, shows you how these hybrids perform uh, in the official variety trials across the state and uh, any information you need or any comments about the website uh, feel free to reach out to me i'd like to thank uh, dr jason kelly from the university of arkansas dr eric larson from mississippi state uh, mr dennis burns from the osu ag center dr dan Fromme from the osu ag center and dr brent bean from the united sorghum uh, checkoff program uh, for providing me uh, information for this presentation. And with that, I would like to thank y'all for uh, taking time out of y'all's busy schedule uh, to view my presentation. Please feel free to reach out to me with any questions that you may have. Uh, my contact information is on this slide. Uh, again, I'm Matt Foster. I'm the corn, cotton, and grain sorghum specialist with the LSU Ag Center. Uh, I look forward to meeting everybody around the state. I am going to schedule a, a, a ride through the Wolves Parish with Justin, so I'm looking forward to that. Again, uh, reach out to me. I'm here to help. Uh, I look forward to working with all of you. Thanks.